share with you. Okay, let's go in. Um, yeah, let's start with a round of introductions. I can start and I suggest that then everyone can pick someone else so that we sort of like get to know the names a bit better. Um, so I'm Sarah, I'm the community manager of frictionless data. Um, I'm really eager to hear the presentation by Amber and Adam today. Um, and I'll pass it on to Funda. Sorry. Uh, you want to introduce yourself list? quickly. For what? Just for everybody to know you. Just say something about yourself. Ah, OK. Uh, I tell you myself uh, what, can, uh, what I am doing. So I am PhD student uh, in RGS University uh, in Turkey. My department of biostatistics. I am studying uh, machine learning methods, and then uh, I am studying uh, omic da data sets, uh, omic integration data uh, methods. So uh, now I have a class uh, for PhD. So I'm joining uh, any uh, course, any uh, uh, any education. So I have to um, develop myself. So uh, I am chapter book. Uh, I am writing chapter book now uh, about uh, feature selection methods. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you know. Uh, so uh, we filter methods, proper methods, embedded methods. Uh, yeah, for uh, data science. Mm. <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Just yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for uh, the introduction. So, so, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, before uh, I have been, uh, I have been um, Netherlands. Uh, I'm studying with um, Rachel Kiavel. Uh, so uh, I, I wrote my uh, project uh, for um, master thesis. I stayed just two weeks <laughs> because I have to come back because of COVID-19. <laughs> mm. I have not uh, luckily. Mm. So uh, I am studying every, uh, every day. And then... I am a surgeon, a surgeon uh, in the clinics, uh, clinic um, research, yeah. So uh, for a drug center, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Funda. Thank you. you can pick someone else so that the other person can introduce himself or herself. Yeah, thank you. I can go. I'll volunteer myself. I'm Lily. I'm the product manager for Frictionless, and I'm super excited to hear this talk today. Um, I had the pleasure of getting to work with Amber and Adam and Conrad, who I didn't see earlier. Uh, but I haven't talked to them about this project in a while, so I'm really excited to hear from them again today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm based in Austin, Texas. And I will pick Steve. Thanks, Lily. I'm Steve Diggs, Scripps Institutional Oceanography in Loa, California. Um, and I, we are a data repository similar to BicoDemo. So this is right up our alley and very excited to be here today and to watch this demo and to learn more in general about frictionless. I'm going to pick Adam. Hey folks, uh, my name is Adam Shepard. I'm the technical director of BicoDemo, um, which I'll introduce as part of the talk. So thankful to be here. Uh, so I will nominate Amber. Hi, I'm Amber York. Um, I'm an employee at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and I work with Adam and Conrad at BicoDemo. Um, I'm a data manager and I help people day to day, our principal investigators make their data interoperable and reusable. Um, my background is in marine biology and computer science. Um, so I kind of bridge the technical and uh, um, communication skills with the PI's uh, bridge there. <laughs> um, 
And so I guess logically next in our, our group, let's just get Conrad. Hey, I'm Conrad. Um, I'm a software developer at BigoDemo. I apologize that my video isn't on. My internet is pretty bad. Um, I'm usually based in Berlin, Germany, but I'm right now actually in Woods Hole where, where BicoDemo is, is located. So um, I'll pass it on to Dana. Hey, hi everyone. Um, I'm Dana Gerlach. I work with the BicoDemo group at HUI. My background is oceanography, geology, geochemistry focus. Um, and I'm sort of just lurking here. Um, to hear what everyone is doing. All right, thanks. I will pass it to Key. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Keith. I'm at uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, NCI, uh, and a postdoctoral fellow there. Uh, fun fact, I actually took an oceanography class in undergrad, really loved it. Uh, it was just for fun, like over the summer and then decided to apply to oceanography programs uh, for grad school later on and tried to sell them that they could use a bioinformatician like back in 2012 or something. And rightfully so, didn't get into scripts in other places, but uh, I still have a special place in my heart for oceanography and uh, really respect and love the work that people do. So I'm excited to be here today. And I will pass it on to Augusto. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm Augusto. Uh, uh, my background is in mathematics and computer science. I'm a um, public servant. I work at the Ministry of Economy in Brazil. And uh, I work as a data engineer. Uh, and I've been using frictionless data since the beginning. We publish a data set um, that uses uh, data packages and table schema extensively, extensively. so I, I, I'm usually around the discussions in, uh, around the frictions data, so glad to be here. Uh, I'll pass it on to Carolina. Hey, hey thanks. Um, hi, I'm Carolina. Um, I actually work with Steve at the CCHDO, and um, yeah, we're a data center, and I'm really excited to learn more about frictionless data and then also the the laminar implementation. Um, so actually, I don't know much. So I'm here to learn and I'm really excited. Thanks for having me. And I guess I'll hand it to Adam. Yeah, I'm Adam Ledbetter. I lead uh, a data management team at the Marine Institute in Ireland um, with a National Oceanographic Data Center for, for the country of Ireland as well. Um, and I've worked with Steve and Adam and the BQ Demo crowd uh, lots as well in the past. So I'm interested to hear what you've got to say, I'm afraid I'm going to have to drop off at, at half past the hour, unfortunately. And I think that might be everybody, unless I've missed somebody. Yeah, I think everybody ought, ought to introduce themselves. So since there are a few people that need to leave a bit early, I'll just pass it on to you, Adam and Amber. Maybe I'll just make you co-host so that you can share a presentation. Sounds great. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, um, right. So. Bico Demo is a, a data management office, and uh, I'll share my screen here. We are funded by the National Science Foundation, and um, what they typically fund for scientific research is uh, transformative. Oh, I'm clicking the wrong thing here. Uh, they they fund transformative research, and so what that means for us is that every single data set that we get from a researcher is like somewhat new, somewhat experimental. Um, and so we see a ton of variability in the data that we get in, in a number of states of research readiness. Um, but essentially we're funded to work with the scientists that receive funding to do their research, to make sure that their data is publicly available and archived for everyone else to use. Uh, and so on the slide here, you'll see just a number of different types of data that we get. So images, video, all sorts of lovely, beautiful, well-crafted Excel spreadsheets with color schemes and merge cells and different types of formats. And ultimately what we wanna do is take all of that data and convert it into something that is a little bit more research ready, um, ready for an archive, ready for long-term use. And so we're thinking about how these observations you know, will be used like 50 years from now when maybe Excel doesn't exist any longer. 
Um, right. And, and ultimately, you know, this information ends up on our uh, data catalog website where folks can then find the data and uh, download it. Um, okay. So, you know, we typically process about 500 data sets a year, um, all sorts of variability. And our staff typically was writing ad hoc scripts or software to um, process those data. Um, and you know, that just became a challenge for a number of different reasons. And we really came to this realization that the knowledge about what a data set needs to be uh, ready for the archive is, has a different shelf life than the software that actually processes it. And so we wanted to separate out the knowledge and the information or data about what a data set needs for the archive from this like code that you know might do that work but might not be around in 50 years from now. Um, and this process um, is called uh, declarative workflows. Uh, and so you know when we, we've been looking at frictionless and working with it for uh, a couple of years now and really got interested in their pipelines code. So I put that up here on the screen in case you're interested. Um, this is sort of like the, the, the schema, the, the philosophy, and then the code in Python that would help us sort of separate the sort of like information about what a data set needs from, you know, the code that actually executed it. That's it. So here on the Adam, screen. Adam, one second. Sorry, not to, not to interrupt, but just, let's just get a couple of terminology things out of the way. We're going to probably continue to use the terminology data data package pipelines and using pipelines, um, the, the actual packages at Frictionless um, are, there's there's some change in, in the structure. So we actually do use also data flows um, and it's, and we're gonna have to talk with you guys about how to adapt to the new Frictionless transform. But in, essentially it's the same thing. So everything Adam says is applicable to the new Frictionless transform. It's the same kind of operations, okay. Yeah, so in essence, what these sort of declarative workflows are is that given a tabular data file, Excel, CSV, whatever that is, you essentially craft a pipeline, um, which, is, which is just a set of ordered named tasks uh, that you want to perform on that data file. And, and Frictionless out of the box comes with a number of common transforms um, that you can use. And these sort of like named tasks act as a proxy for small snippets of code that actually perform the work. So the pipeline, which you see on the screen here, this pipeline spec.yaml is sort of what you want to do in what order on the data set to then transform it. And then this code behind the scenes um, is proxied by these named tasks essentially. And so the results of running the pipeline are, are two files. One, a data package.json, which just sort of describes um, some very lightweight metadata about the resulting file, and then ultimately a CSV file, which is the data that's been transformed. Um, okay, so essentially what we're doing is we want to separate what to do from how it's done. And the three big reasons behind that are sustainability, communication, and provenance. So sustainability is really just like, okay, we realize that the, the information about what to do has a completely different shelf life than the code that actually does it. Um, you know, code comes and goes all the time, which we've seen over the past 10, 20 years, but data always remains. It's, it's so much more long lived. And so we want to capture that separate from the code. Secondly, in communication, you know, these named tasks become almost like a shared language uh, amongst our team. You know, it's much harder for data managers in the team if they need to solve a problem to bring together their own ad hoc scripts on a data set and then talk each other through that. That might be because you know, they have different experiences or different levels of expertise and different types of code. And so having this shared language just helps them communicate easier. It, it also gives our team flexibility. It sort of like shortens meetings because we all have this language that we all speak and understand. Um, but also it gives us flexibility in that data managers can sort of hot swap in and out and work on each other's um, projects uh, without much level of like onboarding. And then finally, uh, provenance. And this is what I think is really cool here is that because the pipeline, that declarative workflow, that ordered list of named tasks is essentially data and it's stored as data, you know, we can query it and ask questions like, ooh, what processors did Amber run? 
or, oh, I found a bug in the way that this particular task runs. Show me all the data sets that I use that task on. And this, we haven't, thankfully, we haven't had to do that yet, but that becomes really critical uh, down the line as, as you try to just sort of manage and curate data over time. And then finally, and I want to get right into the user interfaces, so you guys can see this. Okay, why did we put a user interface over that? And, and it was really just to improve efficiency. And that really comes down to consistency. So uh, that's consistency of the Bicodemo processes. So without the UI, you know, the team could be executing these pipelines, you know, on their laptops or all sorts of different computers. Uh, and, and so the UI sort of forces the data to be in certain places that we know about, that we curate, that we can manage so that every, every data manager has that same experience and has those same expectations. There's no environmental variables that impact the process. And that just sort of helps consistency and reduces our technical debt. But the real efficiency is honestly speed. And that's really just you know, producing pipelines without like syntax issues or typos. Um, you get immediate validation checks because you're in a web form. So you can use those sort of like client side checks on, on the inputs. Um, but also you can visualize what you're doing. And, and this is really key for our data managers that are working with complicated data sets. Uh, it lets them see the data as it's being changed. Uh, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Amber so she can show you what it's like. Yeah, all those, those concepts, um, I especially want to drive home the, the, the benefits of, of visualization. I think that can kind of be not as highlighted or, or sometimes down, downplayed in terms of like, oh, you need to be a real coder, you should do everything on command line. And well, yeah, you can do that, but you having a visualization allows for greater context and you actually end up um, making better data management decisions basically because you can see how the code you're running affects the data, which I'll show you. Let me see, show my screen. Um, can everyone see that? Not if you can see, okay, <laughs> I'll make it big. Okay, so this is um, our laminar interface, which is, as Adam mentioned, built upon it's a web application that is built upon um, data package pipeline and data flows. Um, so I will get right into it and bring up a, a demo, a canned, <laughs> canned demo I've created. Um, let's start with one that's maybe a little simpler a case, maybe only has one thing that has to get fixed. Um, so the way this interface works is that each step that we add um, in this pipeline that's that's built vertically here, um, as Adam mentioned, is a kind of descriptive step that has a snippet of code behind it. Some of them are default out of the box frictionless um, transforms, and some are custom code that Conrad has has uh, expertisely written for us. Um, and it's it's pretty seamless on the front end. So, um, but that's all managed with version control behind the scenes. So we know exactly what what is happening, even though we have to don't have to worry about that on a daily basis. So let's walk through this one. This is coral temperature data that I'm going to load. We've actually connected this to our a new Bigodemo submission system that that we're we're currently uh, um, in beta testing for. So I'm able to load. Um, our files from this submission right from our S3 bucket. Uh, but we can stage files directly from, from storage locations, other places if we have to. Uh, all right, so it's an Excel spreadsheet. I'm just gonna show you briefly what this coral temperature spreadsheet looks like. Uh, so after an inspecting, I can see that the second, we have a header line, we have um, some units, in the second line. And right off the bat, I see I'm probably going to want to uh, change this date format to be an ISO 8601 date um, for interoperability purposes. Uh, so that's something I'm gonna be looking out for after I load the data. And you'll see that there's a bunch of sheets here. One is metadata um, and then a whole bunch of other kinds of data, but I'm just going to be loading some temperature data and so I've chosen the file and I said it's a format Excel. We have a whole bunch of other configurations that I've already set to say, skip the second units line. Uh, I'm just gonna run that load step. And what I was saying before is the power of visualization. So I can see 
This data table, um, I have some nice tools here, like a summary view that will show me the first lines, the random lines, and then last lines. Um, I can filter and can interrogate that way. Uh, so we can do some quality checks with some basic statistics. Um, and it, it won't be meaningful until I set the types to say what's numeric and et cetera. Um, but we have all kinds of kind of immersive tools to make sure we're doing correct data management. And the cool part is that after we apply transforms, we can keep looking at this table and seeing how the changes we've made affect the data. Um, so for example, I mentioned I, I wanna change that date format. So let's, let's go back to the Excel file. It says, this is the format of date, which is a little misleading since it actually doesn't have uh, slashes in it, but it's from this, I can gather that it's month, day, four digit year. So that is what I put into as the input format. Um, I'm telling it I want to type this as date. Uh, and I want to output uh, this, which is um, ISO 8601 format. And I'm going to, you know what, um, I'm going to transform it in place instead of make a new field just because I want to show you the dynamic table view. So sorry for jumping around here, give to me one second because I want to show you how this updates. So I have the date column here. I'm going to run this date transform. And I'm not changing time zone, um, but that is possible to do. So you'll see now I have uh, the date is now transformed into ISO format. And it's typed as date which is important for doing statistical calculations on what's the maximum of a date. <laughs> um, and now I'm gonna set the other types. Uh, let me just uh, set types. This is gonna infer um, and so this gives its inference based on, I think the first few lines Conrad maybe can correct me on that, the first maybe a few hundred lines, but um, I've already run this pipeline quite a bit and I know that I, I need to make these actual uh, support decimals. So I'm gonna do number format and I'm gonna set the type. So I'll see in this data table, I still have a lot of things as string because I just loaded it, that as the default um, load. And I'm going to set the types. Oh, and it's giving me an error with some very useful feedback, which is telling me at this row number, this tank can't be set as integer. And this is a common thing with things we encounter with stations or, or, or labels like this, like identifiers, that it might look like an integer at first, but actually it's, it should be ter termed as strings because they put things like A or B like that. So I'm going to adjust correct course and say, this is actually a string. Let's try again. See if we got all the things. So ran so successfully. We've got our, our uh, typing set correctly. Let me just run some st the statistics. So I'll get some basic statistics, um, max, min, and we have potential to do some other more complex custom statistics. Like if we need to make a unique species list, um, we can download a separate file or just view the species. Um, that's important when we're doing name resolving and things like that. And then this other thing you see with a red exclamation part is telling us that we ran um, a good tables validation check that came back with an issue. Um, the, the validation is, frictionless validation is, um, there's a lot of them that are out of the box, very useful, but this is another case where it's, this is a custom check that um, we've decided we wanted to add to check the names of all the columns to see if they conform to Bico Demo's naming conventions, which this is showing me the columns that don't conform to that. Um, we will replace like spaces with underscores, um, not have punctuation in the, in the names, not have them start with a number, things that support interoperability in a number of applications that users want down the line, like MATLAB, or if you want to program in C, 
Um, so we have naming conventions to make sure everyone can use these data after they're dumped from the pipeline. So um, I'm not, I think we've probably extended, ex gone through our time, but we can find and replace um, or, or rename the, the columns directly or use regular expressions um, to rename the column names. But so, and then um, dumping the pipeline um, produces, like Adam was saying, those that those um, combination of files. So we have the pipeline spec, which shows the, the captures the instructions of the pipeline itself and allows you to rerun the pipeline. And then the, the output of that is the coral temperature CSV, which is in a format that anyone can use. You don't have to have a specific application um, to use CSV. Anyone can use this, it's democratized. Um, and the data package JSON, which is the metadata that provides context and describes that, that data file. So I kind of just went fast and furious through that. Um, and that's, I think that's the end of our time. Or are there any quest, questions about this part of this? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so it's great to have this time now because we can sort of answer questions that um, are important to you or we can show you all the processors or this time is really for, for you to get what you need out of this. So yeah, we're happy to help in any way or answer any questions. Right, like, like, like Adam was saying that behind each step is a snippet of code and some are out of the box um, frictionless uh, transforms and some are our custom ones that we have, which is actually in a, uh, they're in a public GitHub repository, which I think we had the link to in the agenda, um, that if you wanted to use, reuse some of the processors, the custom processors we've made, that's public. Um, yeah. And um, so just in terms of democratization, democratization of, um, the ability to do the data processing. One of the big effects of having this tool in our group is that um, there were certain types of data sets that not all the data managers would necessarily take because it wasn't in, the, in their programming strength. But um, everyone is comfortable using this now, and you know, they under as long as you understand the transforms. That's the important part. Um, as long as you understand what the transform does and the effects on the data. That's all you need to use this tool. Um, you do have to know regular expressions, which we're, we've all been beefing up on that. <laughs> That's probably the biggest technical barrier in our, in our implementation of this. Really nice work. Thank you. Conrad is, has been a saving grace. He's been so great about communicating with us about like what we need and tweaks we need made and looking at our weird examples and helping us come with solutions. So. <laughs> I have a question. Hey, Steve. Mm -hmm. for, for everyone, really. Um, you know, frequently, and, and Adam and I have been having these same talks about CFNet, CDF, and, and moving away from custom formats where the scientist who provides the data producer has complete freedom with the vocabulary and the structure of the data. And they're doing things to try to write a paper. And so that explains a lot of the heterogeneity of what you get. And what ends up happening, it, it, uh, as Adam said, is NSF hires people just to untangle everything. Uh, we're the semantic go-betweens. And that's a, that can be a lot of work. And so now I get the friction and frictionless data in, um, what I want to know is with the pipelines, how much is, what does out of the box look like? You know what I, you know, I want to know what, I want to see that unboxing YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, I got, I got pipelines. Hey, and then I had to add these things, right? Oh, and then I had to write a translator to do this because we have this really weird thing. And mm -hmm. this is the, you know, programming interface that I had to use. It's very super, super well documented. I assume this exists. But if you could get into that a little bit, I don't know from, you know, I first saw frictionless pipelines and then I opened the box and these are the modifications we had to make. And this is basically how to resource that usefulness to go from out of the box 
to production. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to give Conrad a, a chance to maybe address the practicality of that. But in terms of, of our, our experience, working as a pilot project with frictionless themselves, um, they were really responsive to taking our feedback and, um, and use cases and actually taking our cases and making changes in, in the out of the box, like you're saying, Steve, to make it more capable out of the box. So they were really responsive to trying to, to make it more versatile for ocean, well, science in terms of the kinds of data we do, not just ocean science, it's applicable, but to like a lot of scientific applications. Um, so that, the first part of the answer is out of the box is evolving over time to be more capable. Um, but I'll let Conrad maybe address like what was maybe some of the more challenging cases for our quote unquote custom stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure if you how much you want me to go into detail about certain custom processors, but I think I think the two major changes that or the two major developments that needed to happen from from just data package pipelines to what Amber just demoed um, are obviously the the custom processors that there, there's a, a repository that exists that has them, um, and then also kind of the getting it into a a UI and making sure that you could click a button and then somewhere on a server somewhere, like a, a pipeline is actually running. Um, so yeah, I feel like those are the two, the two kind of bigger things. Um, I, you can let me know if you want me to go into detail about any either one of them specifically. Well, what I guess a lot of the customization we're doing is, is some, some of it was more to just on the UI, make elevate some of our preferences or things we do often. Um, so like like certain date formats or certain transforms we do often like like changing um that uh, latitude and longitude from different formats to decimal degrees um that's something we do often so we built the processor just to do that um uh, and then the the other thing is we did add some like for example date formats we added the ability to have as input formats certain kinds of dates we sometimes see that aren't necessarily interoperable down the line, like like MATLAB um, date num, <laughs> which is not necessarily a human readable date or easily consumable down the line for applications e either. So um, uh, yeah, and I'm not forgetting now, but there's a few other interesting date and time format choices that we, we made as input options that, um, yeah, so, so some certain configurations or, or things we do often we've elevated. I don't know if that helps answer the out of the box question, but. Well, I guess yeah. one of the questions I had is, you know, when I take, you know, it out of it out of the box, um, is there a web interface or do I have to make that? What's the system requirement? Can I run it on Ubuntu? If so, which version? Um, and, you know, what port would I attach it to? I mean. We can go from the very, very technical to the conceptual, but the conceptual is taking it out of the box and what can I do with it right away? Once it's, you know, once I insert the batteries and close the door and, you know, fire it up, can I suck in a CSV file and do some basic things? Or do I have to start customizing it to what I expect to get right away? Sure, I can, I can elaborate on that a little bit. I mean, so to be clear, we haven't actually, no one else has used this beyond us. So I think that's that's like, there, there certainly are some things that we're probably not thinking about that would need to be customized. Um, one thing, so I, it, you could just literally run the, the data package pipelines on your computer with, with the custom processors, um, like in the terminal or uh, running some like custom Python code, like that would be easy. I, I don't know the exact requirements, but definitely Ubuntu. Um, and you could definitely do that to, to have access to the UI. Um, you could, sure, you could clone my repository and, and run it locally on your computer um, and run the server locally on your computer, but none of that's that useful. You probably want to host it somewhere. Um, and so we have, we, we host it on AWS and we have uh, some infrastructure scripts using Terraform. So that's very, very easy to just kind of plug and play. You just type Terraform apply, and then it creates the whole infrastructure in your AWS 
background if you're already using AWS. Um, and then in terms of the actual code of the of the repository, I would say probably the big one that you'd have to change. Um, Amber, can you go back to the to the pipeline? Um, on the top, you see this zero files staged and two submission files. So these are the kind of the sources for for where um, for where the pipeline runs from. Um, and the staged area is is kind of a, a relic of an old infrastructure that we that Pico Dima used to have, which is um, a file system on on a HUI server that um, essentially like you can type the file path here and then it'll upload it into AWS and, and use that as the kind of the, the source file for um, for starting the pipeline. And then the submission to submission files area is um, is this new submission tool that we've been developing. Um, yeah, you could just click on it and show it. like it's a submission tool, a Bicodema submission tool, and people upload their files here. So that's the that's another available source for the pipeline to run. Um, for you, you'd probably want to kind of make some custom code of your own source, essentially um, a, a place where the where it loads the CSVs from. Um, and you'd probably need to make a new kind of little button up here that that like allows you to to specify which which file you you want to use. Um, but within you know just going back to the, what it can be very simple in in the like load step if you have a pipeline you can you can put whatever source directly there. But if we're talking about uh, user interface like that, those are enhancements that um, reduce speed. I mean. Um, reduce time to development and uh, running of the pipeline. But you can, at the end of the day, you could just stick a source path in your load step of your pipeline um, to a, a place that, where the file is accessible. Um, so actually, I have a question for frictionless people on the line. Um, we went developed Laminar after uh, a collaborative pilot with you guys. Um, but I know that the open knowledge ecosystem and frictionless tools are evolving so fast and so rich. Um, and there's there's often things I that we don't know about that that become available. So is is anyone working on like um, a more generic open knowledge frictionless tool for um, visual visualizing and running pipelines? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> so that's on our roadmap for hopefully by the end of this year, Yevgeny, who is our main developer, for those of you that have not met Yevgeny, he couldn't make this meeting. Um, he is working on a new version of our existing browser applications. Uh, Good Tables is one of them, and I can put some links in the chat. And so the answer is yes, but it isn't done yet. And we will be reaching out to the community when it is done because we're gonna try and do some like use cases with groups to try and test it. Um, yeah. I'm also gonna put into the chat a list of the built-in transform functions that are part of the frictionless transform, which is our newer code that was written after we finished this pilot, but which was heavily informed by what we learned in this pilot. Um, and Amber, I know you wanted to talk about maybe transitioning to that code. So maybe we can set up another call with Yevgeny to- Yeah, that would be great. We were, we were trolling the, um, the, the web page you guys put up about migration. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> but, but we, we have a lot of questions. <laughs> Yeah, and that, um, I was just, I was gonna put that link in here and I was like, that might be out of date now. Uh, yeah, which is a good thing to uh, remind me that I should look at that again. Um, but yes, there are a lot of built-in functions as well. I just wanted to say for the folks that are kind of new to transforms pipelines, um, I'll give you a little story. So. One of the conferences that we go to uh, is called AGU, it's American Geophysical Union. Uh, it's like for geosciences and the submission deadline is like months before the conference. Uh, and our community always sort of like rushes to submit an abstract uh, to present at the conference. And so this one year I had presented like, hey, I wanna talk about 
um, declarative workflows and pipelines. And as the conference was approaching, I was like, oh my gosh, I haven't done any work on this. And so it was like two weeks out and I was downloading frictionless data package pipelines. And you know, I have a very low threshold for like trying to figure things out. Um, and, and this is a huge credit to, to Open Knowledge Foundation and the Frictionless Data Project because I was able to go to the repo, the GitHub repos, download data package pipelines, and get it to work like almost like that first or second try. And I have the folder structure from that AGU talk of like, okay, here's my version one, here's my version two of trying new and things and more complicated things. And within that week, um, I had done four different pipelines of, of iterating on, on this process. And um, it was just such a great developer experience or data management experience to try to get that stuff to work on the command line, no UI, um, and just to see results. So um, it's a big credit to the project and you know everything that we've shown here with UI is great, but um, please don't let that huge sort of like hill of, oh, I've got to figure out this UI or, or custom processors deter you from the philosophy behind capturing the information about your transforms and separating that from the code. These declarative workflows, that philosophy, whether it's frictionless, pipelines, the transforms, or some other mechanism uh, is really important, I think, for data management offices that are sort of long-lived. Um, and I encourage you to just try these, these GitHub repos, excuse me, as my voice cracks. Um, yeah, try these repos from, from the Frictionless project. Um, they work on your command line. So like if our UI sort of blows up or AWS goes away and, and we can't run these UIs, all those pipelines still work uh, right on the command line. So um, it's a very low barrier of entry. I really encourage you to check it out. I'm just going to reiterate something that Adam said, um, that our new Python code, the frictionless framework, is also on the command line. So it's both command line and Python. Do we so have any other questions? Oh, yes, cookies. Hey, um, the, 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 oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you first. <laughs> the, the declarative pipelines, is that, um, I've, I've been a, away from this project for, for quite a while. <laughs> I'm kind of trying to catch up. Or is that a standard that is documented kind of on its own or with like examples somewhere? I've been sort of clicking through the GitHub repos and I see a lot about kind of like the, you know, the Python API and everything, but I'm looking for kind of the more basic documentation about how those declarative pipelines, uh, like the syntax and everything. Yeah, let me find you a link. And Dan, it would be actually really useful to know if the link I send you does not answer your questions. Um, sure. we, we did a big push on our documentation earlier this year, um, but, you know, Do writing docs is hard, so it's totally possible that we miss something and it'd be very helpful to have that info so we could try and fix it. Sure, I mean, reading while listening and watching a screen share is also hard, so it may be on me. <laughs> So I just found my folder from AGU 2017. Um, I'm happy to post that in GitHub if anyone wants to see me sort of struggle through. Okay, yeah, I see some head nods. So I'll do that and post the link right now. So I was just gonna ask if anyone has been thinking explicitly about kind of quality assurance checks to incorporate into these kind of pipelines. So things like looking for outliers, um, plotting distributions along different columns and things like that, because it seems like it would be a really useful thing and fit really well with the way you all are thinking about kind of processing these data sets and trying to get them into a friendly format. Um, but these are the, the kinds of things that like, I think I would typically want to do first and probably makes sense to check for because very often you are going to have like just a value that got screwed up by Excel or input wrong by the user or whatever and it's it could be obvious to detect when you plot it and um, yeah I was just curious if this is yeah. something you all are thinking about. I'm gonna jump in on that so um, we've had a 
big push the last couple of years on making new architectures and and you know figuring out what we need for today's needs and, and going forward. And um, that that concept of data quality checks and tools is is definitely a discussion we're having. We made a big list of, of kind of what we can do now, what we do now that that's, takes time or is painful because um, and like what tooling we could use to improve our, our data quality process, which right now is is more um, uh, each data manager does does that kind of on their own um, in it we're talking about further than the the basic statistics I showed you. Um, so like like for species names, we run that through a taxonomic name match to make sure we have quality species names. So things like that. Um, and and like you're saying, looking for outliers and, and things. Um, I think that's an active area that we're we're talking about now in terms of making beefing up that statistics capability and putting that also maybe capable to check right when the submissions come in because that's the kind of time we have them, the people we want to help triage and say, hey, can you fix this? <laughs> we, we noticed that this exists. Can you go fix that? Because <laughs> um, some things it's appropriate for us to help and do as data managers, but think, some things the original data um, creator should be making the call of what is noise and what is not. It's not appropriate for us to, to smooth something unless, you know, it could be a real peak of chlorophyll that, that it was a significant event, you know? So um, that's, that's, um, that's on the, the PI and the data creator to, to make that assessment. Um, but it's, it's on us as data managers to help them figure out if there's quality issues. So, <laughs> but yeah, that's a great point. And um, I think that is something we wanna be looking at um, and integrating of those kind of statistics calculations a few different places in our workflow. I would actually suggest that that's something that could be pushed upstream to frictionless or at least could be on their radar too because that's generally applicable and useful mm -hmm. and would fit in well with this kind of like pipeline thinking uh, towards data sets. Yeah, there actually, there are tooling for that within the validation, frictionless validation, which we refer to as good tables because that's what the original independent repo used to be called. Um, uh, and so there are um, calculations and things like that that can help you detect outliers or things that are outside different statistical, um, a whole bunch of tools for that that we haven't fully delved into and liberated and in, term, in terms of visualiz visualizing the results of that in a context that I think you're talking about that is meaningful like then plotting and looking like here are the outliers um, and visually displaying that information. Um, but that's certainly possible. One more follow-up question for frictionless as well. Um, so it seems like now you've had several different uh, kind of domains use the tooling and kind of customize it for their own purposes. Have you all considered like how to generalize this kind of uh, practice of basically taking these generic tools in frictionless and then when someone has like oceanography specific or genomic specific or whatever applications where they want to add custom logic for validation and things like that where they could that could be done in a consistent way because uh, that seems like also something rather than have everyone kind of reinvent the wheel within their own subdomain if you provide like general tooling to extend and build on uh, I know some of that I'm sure already exists, but maybe just formalizing it and saying, hey, like if you want to take it and use it in a field, here's a good example of how this can be done for whatever field. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would love to do that. Um, I've had that thought, but we have not done that before. And I think that we are, I don't think we were really at the stage where we could do it before. You know, I think we needed more use cases. Um, but yeah, I think that would be really nice. We have time for one other little tiny question and then we'll go for the big stuff. So if you want. I, I don't have a question. I just want to say this, like, this is amazing. And, you know, thanks all for who's involved in this, like, it sounds like um, kind of 
exactly what we've been, you know, try, trying to achieve for a long time. And so, yeah, this is really, really exciting. Thanks. Thanks. I actually do have like a small question. Um, so, um, there, there is still some pre-processing necessary to get um, the data into a format that will go into the pipeline. Is that correct? In 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 mo in many cases, in most cases, <laughs> or or is everything in the pipeline? For us, that's a good good question, Carolina. For us, the goal was to have as much as possible in the pipeline so that um, it was captured as configuration or data. Um, right. We had this goal of like, can we at least get like 80% of all the data sets that come into our office um, completely done with a pipeline? And I'll let Amber speak to how well that's gone. Yeah, we way ex exceeded that goal quite a long time ago. Um, it, 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 you know, through Conrad's good work and our collaboration with the pilot, I think that we were able to capture a lot of things we thought would be edge cases for a long time. And some of the um, edge cases we still do, quote unquote, pre-processing, things like, um, like currently we can't transpose a whole table rows to columns. Um, but that being said, it looks like in the new frictionless transform, there is a step called transpose. So, um, like even that, I think uh, if we if we figure out or decide we want to migrate to the, the newer way, like some of those edge cases might be even reduced even further than what we have now. But um, in terms of how we capture that, we can refer to it as pre-processing. And we just, as our SOP as data managers, we we make sure to describe if we had to do anything by, by hand or in Excel that's not captured in provenance, um, we make sure to capture it. And in fact, each one nice thing is we added the ability to have notes on every single step of our transform in case it wasn't obvious why you're changing this specific row of date format, um, you know, just to provide the context of why some of these transforms were made. And so that we make sure to have that kind of note for any pre-processing that happened to the source between the, between the file that was submitted to us and what was loaded into the pipeline. So I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, but it totally answers the yeah. question. And that's awesome that you also have um, the ability to add extra notes to each of those um, you know, processing steps. That's awesome. Yeah, because it's, it's things that might not always be apparent. Like sometimes we might have a step in there that does a find and replace on a certain value and it wouldn't be obvious why we did that, but we have the note saying, oh, the submitter said they recorded this station wrong and it should be this. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And then is there, I assume that there's also flexibility in like, in, in that, that dump step, that output step, that that's part of that customization process, is that, or is it like, I'll, I'll let Conrad speak, but the dump step is is an out of the box thing. Um, I think the customization we did was just to specifically add some metadata, maybe. It's it's unfortunately not out of the box it, um, because there's there's dump to path, there's dump to SQL um, out of the box, but then we have dump to S three, so it dumps to the an S three bucket in AWS. Um, so that's. Unfortunately, not out of the box, but it's it's an, the custom processor exists in the repository, and it's easy enough to to implement. Okay, I want to be mindful of time. We have like one minute left, uh, and before I leave you, uh, I would like to make some community announcements. Um, so first of all, um, some of you may know already, but we're organizing the Arcathon on seven and eight. October. So that's going to be very exciting. It's going to be a two-day online event. If anyone here has a cool project uses, using Frictionless, even if it's just an idea and you would like to, I mean, we can help you shape it as well. But please, um, we have submissions for projects open now. So uh, please submit your project uh, if you want to. Uh, it would be cool to prototype it uh, with a bunch of other Frictionless contributors from all around the world. 
Um, I can maybe, you will find the link in the agenda, but I can also put it here in the chat. Yeah. Um, and we are opening also uh, registration for people in a few weeks, and that will be announced on our website and probably on Twitter as well. Um, other thing that we wanted to announce is that you still have a few days left to apply to be on the third cohort of Frictionless Fellows. Um, in case anyone is interested, in case you know anyone that could be interested, please share. Um, it's a great opportunity to learn more about Frictionless data, but more in general, it's about open science. So uh, it's a cool opportunity. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that the next community call is on Thursday of September. Uh, it's going to be exceptionally one hour late because um, we're going to present our the work that we did the Dryad, and since they are based on the West Coast, it was a bit early for them, as Steve here may know. <laughs> and yeah, I think that's all from us. Thanks for everyone for joining. Thanks, Adam and Amber, for this very, very cool presentation. And I'll see you next month. Unless, Lily, you want to add anything? Just that if anybody else is interested in collaborating with us, we're always happy to have that discussion and uh, we love working with scientists and data managers. So, yeah. And thank you. It's great to see you, Amber and Adam and Conrad and everybody else. We're right back at you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great Thanks, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.